Hey guys, Miss Marisa here, and in this video, we're going to talk about drawing Lewis structures for compounds that are covalent. Now, we have to remember that the big difference between covalent and ionic is that with ionic compounds, we show brackets and charge, and we show electrons being transferred. However, with covalents, we want to show electrons being shared. Now, I know a lot of you remember how to do this from pre-P, so this is going to be a refresher, uh, but we are going to make sure that we readdress all those kind of quirky things that we might see. Uh, such as expanded octets or double and triple bonds um, or exceptions to the octet rule because there are a few kind of weird things that can happen. Um, also, I will warn you that there are other methods, other steps you could use to draw a Lewis dot structure. Um, however, I find students that kind of go through the steps that I'm going to talk about here tend to be most successful when drawing Lewis structures, especially when you're talking about some of those weird circumstances with the double and triple bonds and the expanded octets. So if you have to pick a method, I prefer you to use this one because like I said, you tend to be more successful that way. So with that said, you notice our steps here is that we we would first add up the total number of valence electrons for the compound. So I would look at my elements, see how many valence electrons they bring, and tally all of that together. This is how many dots were allowed to draw, how many valence electrons were allowed to draw. So then we're going to pick a central atom. And when picking the central atom, sometimes it's super obvious. Sometimes it's just the atom that's present in the fewest count. Like if I only have one of a particular element versus four of a different element, then obviously the one I only have one of is going to go in the middle. Um, however, sometimes it's not as obvious. And so then we have to use the rule that the least electronegative element goes in the middle. Um, one exception to that is that hydrogen can never be central. And that has to do with the number of electrons that uh, satisfy it in a compound. Um, it just won't only make one bond versus multiple bonds. Um, also, as a warning, carbon loves to be a central atom. So if you ever see carbon, that's probably a pretty good guess as to it being your central atom. So then we put down the central atom and place the other atoms around it. And we call those other atoms the peripheral atoms. And then we bond up our atoms. Now, you can either do this with two dots to show the two shared electrons, um, or you can do it with a line. And so I'll kind of show you that here in just a little bit, how that would look either way. Um, now, what we would next do is fill up our peripheral atoms to satisfy the octet rule. But we have to be careful. We can only draw as many dots as we tallied up in step number one. So once I run out of those dots, I have to stop drawing electrons. So we'll have to be careful with that here in just a minute. Now, most things want eight electrons to be stable. However, there are a few exceptions. Hydrogen likes only two electrons to be stable. Um, beryllium likes four, and boron likes six to be stable. So we want to make sure that we remember those couple of weird ones um, while we're drawing, and so that way we don't uh, over-satisfy those particular elements. All right, so then once you hit your total number of valence electrons, as I already said, you got to stop drawing. Um, and so if you've run out of dots to satisfy everybody, that's where you got to make a double or triple bond. And so we'll see some examples with that here in just a minute. Um, if you have extra dots that you need to show, or say you have more than four atoms that are going around your central atom, then what that means is that your central atom is going to be an expanded octet. Another word for that is hypervalent. Now, there's only certain elements that can be hypervalent. You notice it mentions that they have to be in period three or beyond. And that's because once I hit period three, those elements are capable of using d orbitals to fill up and to bond up. Uh, before period three, you only have S and P orbitals, and so your elements aren't big enough to accommodate for those uh, expanded octets. So then it says in advanced structures, you may on the very infrequent occasion have an uneven number of electrons. We never really saw that in pre-AP, but every once in a while in AP, you might see that. Um, it's not very common, but just in case you do, what would happen is that the any extra electrons that we have would go on the central atom. Uh, so just as a warning that could come up every once in a while where that number of electrons is uneven. All right, um, we're going to talk about some of this other stuff kind of as we go through. But before we do a couple of examples, I want to kind of show you uh, something that I've created that helps us to uh, show 
what kind of Lewis dot structures would be accepted uh, by AP graders on the AP test. So I'm going to actually show you this for just a little bit. Um, so here are two examples of some Lewis dot structures that are okay. All right. You notice on this one, they put shared electrons as dots, which is totally fine. However, in this one, instead of using two dots to represent a bond, instead a line has been used to represent that bond. And that is totally okay too. So either one of these is totally awesome. Um, honestly, in AP, I tend to draw it this way, especially because when we have expanded octets where I have a lot of bonds around my central atom, this tends to be a little bit easier to show everything that's going on. Here are some examples of some Lewis dot structures that we don't want to do. Um, first off on this one, you notice that the dots are really unclear to read, like they're really pale. So you want to make sure that your dots are super clear so that the grader can very clearly see that you know exactly how many electrons you're supposed to show. They don't have to question whether or not you've actually put all the dots that you're supposed to. Also, you don't want to do a combination of dots and lines. So you don't want to do this where you put two dots and then connect it with the line uh, because that kind of looks like you're doubling up on stuff. So you want to be really careful about that. Also, if you notice back up here, um, I always show those electrons in nice, lovely pairs. So again, it was super clear to the reader the AP reader, um, that they know that those electrons are in orbitals together, okay? So on this one, the issue with this guy is that it's not very clear that those electrons are in pairs. And so you want to be really careful of that. Here's a few other ones that are not so good. Um, here we've got both dots and lines again, so we, we don't want to do that. It, that would almost look like we have double bonds happening, and it, kind of the same thing here. Don't do both dots and lines. Pick one or the other. Uh, now, I will warn you, there are some advanced chemistry books that instead of doing the dots around the peripheral atoms, uh, they'll actually do these lines. Um, AP graders do not like that. Um, they prefer to see those dots shown around. So don't do the lines like that. It's just lazy, to be honest. Um, and it's not really a good notation. Um, also, on this one, you can see they've forgotten the dots on the peripheral atoms. So you want to make sure that you always show all the dots you're supposed to. Okay, um, this one right here, the issue is that the unshared electron pair, rather than just putting the dots at the top, um, they put a line and then the dots, and that line indicates a bond. So it's almost like you're showing a bond to a pair of electrons, and so that's not really a, a good notation either. Okay, so you got to be careful with that. Now, last but not least here, this one, instead of putting the unshared electron pair on the top of nitrogen here, they actually made a double bond, and so What's happened is that, you know, we've we've kind of over expanded this chlorine here. This chlorine, if you notice, has two, four, six, eight, ten electrons that it has claim to. And so we do not want to expand the octet of anything that's peripheral. The only thing that could create an expanded octet uh, would be the central atom itself. And not even in this instance with nitrogen, uh, because nitrogen is only in period two, and so it's not period three or later. Um, so some things to kind of watch out for as we do this. So with that said, let's go ahead and do a couple of examples together just to, again, refresh our memory, make sure that we remember how to do all these. So we're gonna actually start off here with oxygen gas. And so the first thing I would do is get myself a formula for oxygen gas. I know oxygen gas is diatomic, so it is O2. And so what I would then do is go find oxygen on the periodic table. And I see oxygen is in group 16. And I know if something is in group 16, then that means it brings six valence electrons with it. There are two of those. So that's going to give us a grand total of 12 electrons that I need to show. Now, here where I only have two elements, I don't really have a true central atom. And so therefore, I kind of just put these two oxygens next door to each other. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bond them. Remember when I draw a line that that is two electrons, so that would be one, two, okay? And then I start filling up around the elements. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
I hit my 12 electrons that I'm allowed to draw, meaning I have to stop drawing dots. So now here's where I would ask myself, hey, is everybody stable? Well, this oxygen has claim to two, four, six, and these shared electrons, so eight electrons on him, but this oxygen only has six electrons it can claim. By the way, both of these oxygens can claim those two electrons in the bond. It's kind of almost like a Venn diagram where they're both sharing what's in the middle there. Um, so since this oxygen is short, but I've run out of dots to satisfy everybody, this is where I would need to make a double bond. So instead of one of these unshared electron pairs here, what I'm going to do is actually cross that off and bring it in here in the middle to create a shared double bond. Uh, by the way, having a double bond means that there's four shared electrons between those two atoms. By the way, once you see that something is a double bond, you don't have to show that you crossed it off. You could simply just not draw the dots if you can kind of predict that on your own. All right, next we're going to draw water. Um, water is one of those that I bet a lot of you could honestly uh, draw from memory, but just to kind of recap here how it would work. Okay, I have two hydrogens. Hydrogen is in group one, so that would be one valence electron, but there's two of those elements, okay? And as we just said a minute ago, oxygen is in group 16, so it brings six valence electrons. Well, that gives me a grand total of eight electrons I need to draw. Now, here's where I would want to pick a central atom. So a couple things to remember. Again, it's the element present in the fewest count, or it's the least electronegative, However, hydrogen can never go in the middle. So by process of elimination here, we know that the oxygen has to go in the middle. And so I would put my two hydrogens on whatever side. Now, I, you could either put them across from each other, up and down, or however, okay, it doesn't really matter, just kind of pick two sides of the oxygen. And then I'm gonna start drawing in my electrons. So again, I'm gonna bond these up, one, two, three, four. Now, as soon as I've done that, Remember, hydrogen is one of our elements that's okay with only having two valence electrons. Well, look here. It's got a shared bond, and so it has claim to two electrons. So does this one. By the way, part of the reason for that is because hydrogen only has an s orbital to it, and so it's only capable of holding two electrons. Um, our other elements have, would have both S and P, and so that's why they can hold eight, because the combo of the S and P orbitals together would be eight total electrons. So what that means is that I have shown four of these electrons, so the other four need to go around my central atom. And so there's my water. All right, let's go ahead and flip the page and do a couple more. So next here I have boron trifluoride. So that would be... B, F, 3. And so now I would want to tally up my electrons. Um, boron is in group 13, so that would have three valence electrons bringing with it. Fluorine is in group 17, so that would have seven valence electrons, but there's three of those. So that would be grand total of 21 plus 3, so that means I'm going to be showing here 24 electrons. Okay, so now... I put my boron in the middle. I put my fluorines on three sides. And I start bonding up. So again, my bonds are two electrons each. One, two, three, four, five, six. Next, I start filling up my peripherals. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 filled up the outside, and have hit 24 electrons. Let's see if we've made everybody stable. Well, this fluorine has claimed to 2, 4, 6, 8. All right. This fluorine has 2, 4, 6, 8. This fluorine has 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay, I'm like, that's good. And then I get to boron, and I'm like, 2, 4, 6. Hmm. But wait a minute. Boron is one of our exceptions. It's okay only having six electrons. So this is good as is. By the way, if it wasn't okay for it to have six, that's where then I've run out of dots and I'm going to make a double bond. So let's talk about a double bond here. Let's look at carbonate ion. Uh, we know that the carbonate ion has a formula of CO3 negative two. Okay, so carbon comes with four electrons. 
Oc because it's in group 14. Oxygen, as we've said, has six electrons, but there's three of those. This negative two charge means I add two more electrons to my tally. If this had been a positive charge, by the way, like let's say I had had ammonium polyatomic ion, then I would want to remove an electron. But here I'm going to add them because I had a negative anion. So then I'm going to tally this up. So 6 times 3 is 18, plus 2 more is 20, plus 4 more is 24 electrons. So as we can already kind of see, this one has got the same count as we did here, so it's going to start to look similar, but that carbon that's going to be in the middle is going to be a little bit short, so we're going to talk about what to do with it. So I'm going to put my carbon in the middle. I'm going to put my oxygens around. Because again, carbon is not only the least electronegative of those elements, but also I have the fewest count of it. So then I'm going to bond up 2, 4, 6, and then I start placing my dots. 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. And I'm like, row, row, I run out of dots. So this is where the carbon could request that that one of those oxygens share another pair with it. So I'm going to pick one of them. It really doesn't matter which one you pick here. And I'm going to put myself a double bond. Now, one other thing we want to do since it's an ion is we want to draw brackets around this. And our charge of negative 2. By the way, I mentioned just a minute ago that it really didn't matter where I put that double bond at. It could have been any of these three locations. It didn't really matter which oxygen I used. So as a reminder, what that means is that carbonate is a resonant structure, that there's other equivalent Lewis dot structures to it. So for example, I could have drawn the double bond with this oxygen. and brackets with the charge. Okay, so I could have drawn it there. Or I could have drawn the double bond with the oxygen on the bottom. Let's see if I can squeeze this all in here, y'all. <laughs> By the way, on occasion, on AP questions, they will ask you to draw all the possible structures for something that is resonant. And if they ask you to do that, this is the kind of thing you would draw. You would show that the double bond could have been at any of those three locations. And as we'll talk about um, in our next class, in reality, the true structure is kind of a blend of these three. So we're going to talk more about resonant structures on another day. All right, let's talk about the xenon tetrafluoride. Ooh, that's kind of a doozy, right? Okay, so xenon, X-E. Tetra means four, so I'm going to have four fluorines. Now, I am going to go ahead and mention something here. Um, normally, your uh, noble gases don't like to bond. So this is kind of unusual to see it in a bond, um, but it can happen if it's under the right temperature, pressure, conditions. So with that said, um, xenon brings eight valence electrons with it because it's in group 18. Fluorine bring seven in group 17 times four. Okay, so doing some quick math here. 36, oops. Okay, so let's count them up. I'm gonna put somebody in the middle. That somebody is gonna be xenon here. And now I'm gonna put my fluorines around. I'm going to bond them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to start filling peripherals. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. And I'm like, okay, I've shown 32, but oh, wait a minute, i got to show 36. So here's the deal. Any extra electrons go on the central atom. So what that means here is that the four remaining electrons will go on the central atom in pairs. It doesn't really matter where you put them. I usually will put them across from each other. And so our final structure for xenon tetrafluoride will look like that. All right, we got one more here. 
and we have ethene C2H4. So first I'm gonna do a tally. Um, C2, each carbon comes with four, and I have two of those. Each hydrogen comes with one electron, and I have four of those. So let's see, that's gonna be a grand total of 12 electrons. All right, now this one is kind of interesting because anytime I see carbon and hydrogen chains, I don't really have a true central atom. I have a central chain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the carbons kind of in the middle and then I'm going to put the hydrogens distributed around them. Now, since I have four hydrogens, that means two hydrogens are going to be on one carbon, and the other two will be bonded to the other carbon. So now I'm going to start bonding things up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, I've showed ten electrons here. Hydrogens are good to go. They've been bonded up, so they have two electrons apiece. But I think some of you can already see kind of the issue here with carbon. I only have two more electrons I'm allowed to show. Well, if I put them on this carbon, then this carbon is short. If I put them on this carbon, then that carbon is short. So guess where I'm gonna put them? I'm gonna make a double bond. I ran out of dots to satisfy everybody. So that's where I make double and or triple bonds. All right, hopefully this helped you kind of jog your memory on Lewis dot structures. Um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.